constraints. So the second talk and the second course actually is from NND from Lacan University, formal invariant and integration, uh, which is of course another uh, area of uh, research where the It's okay. Yeah. Okay. So, uh, thanks. Uh, I will. So I. I will. What I will do is uh, for this lecture, I will rather quickly run through some slides to describe some uh, this type of problems, and I will. Uh, I will describe some problem which I, uh, which people have been trying to prove, uh, and then I will start with some estimates in this direction. Yeah. So, so at the beginning, maybe it runs pretty fast. Okay. So, uh, my, so here it is a classical problem where. Uh, so we have a compact remaining manifold. So the question is whether or not this remaining metric you can find a positive function so that the new metric, the scalar curvature is constant. So this u, then the problem is in terms of u, it's just this semi-linear partial differential equation because the left hand side divided by this power is the new scalar curvature. It's just a computation from definition. So this is the equation to be solved. So, so this problem actually is a variational problem. So uh, fix a manifold, if you look at the remaining metric, so there is a functional you integrate the scalar curvature divided by volume of certain power. So then it is a functional, so there is a critical point, Euler Lagrange equation. So if you look at the critical point of a functional, so that's actually an equation. So this is actually the Einstein equation. So, and uh, if one, because we are looking for a uh, new metric of this form. It's a variational pro uh, uh, it's a conformal metric. So we only look at functional of positive function multiplied by this g. So you run through your, uh, this positive function. So one can think, so this is, a, one can think of if, if the total metric space is R3, you can say th this is a line in the R3. So, so then you can, one can look at the, this functional restricted to this conformal class. Then the critical point will be given by new scalar curvature equal to constant. So namely, this equation actually has a variational formulation. So actually, there are three mutually exclusive cases to depending on the first eigenvalue of this operator. This is the, this is the Laplacian operator. So this is called conformal Laplacian. So one should solve this equation with this constant should be the first eigenvalue of this operator. So this problem was solved through many years work. So after that, after this problem was solved, people look at solution space, try to understand uh, the space of solutions. So there are three cases. One is first eigenvalue is zero. Well, then that's a linear problem. So this is a second order elliptic operator equal to zero now, so then it is known that the 
eigenspace for the first eigenvalue should be one dimensional. So zero, uh, so existence is also clear. So this is very clear. So another case is the first eigenvalue of this linear operator is negative. So one needs to solve an equation with a negative sign. So in that case, the uniqueness is actually clear, and it follows from standard maximum principle. And existence in this case actually is also known, uh, can be proved easily. So because if you take a small positive epsilon as a constant, so it's uh, going to be a sub-solution, and the other one will be a super-solution. So once there is a sub-solution less than a super-solution for such an elliptic e equation, then there will be a solution in between. So that's clear. So, but in this case, if the first eigenvalue is positive, it's much more complex. So if this manifold is our standard sphere, then all solutions are known. So this one known, and uh, it's unique modular conformal diffeomorphism of the standard sphere. So if, if it's not SN, solution space more complicated, so one question would be, uh, is say, whether all solutions are bounded. So if all solutions are bounded, you know the solution space is compact with very high norm and, and uh, yeah. So there, there's a lot of work on this problem. So starting from Shane and, and then for many works and eventually the result is the answer is no if dimension n is greater or equal than 25 and dimension below 25, then the answer is yes. And actually in this case, the yes was depending on a positive mass theorem. So, so, so this part is the part what I will describe some uh, analysis about is try to solve a fully nonlinear version Yamabe problem. So for this problem, there's a, on a remaining manifold, there's a tensor called Schalten tensor. So this is the Ricci curvature, scalar curvature, and the metric. And the uh, Schalten tensor is, uh, one can think of it uh, as unbiased matrix, symmetric matrix, let's say. So let lambda to be the eigenvalue of this tensor with respect to the metric G, then when we take a trace, we actually get scalar curvature, modular a harmless constant. So therefore, the Yamabe problem in this case can be rephrased as follows. On a remaining manifold, if we assume the sum of the eigenvalues is positive, whether or not one can find a conformal metric to make it equal to one. And a more general question would be, uh, let's say for some other function, you start from it's positive, whether or not you can make it equal to one. So this is, this is for function equal to the sum of lambda, the lambdas. So one can look at other function. So this equation will be a second order fully nonlinear elliptic equation because this AG tilde in terms of, yeah, so it's written in terms of U is like this. This, this is the formula. You define, you have the, we have the definition of the Schalten tensor one compute. So after this conformal change, so it's going to be like this, involving second derivative. So then this is a nonlinear expression. So you, if we look at eigenvalues, 
So it's nonlinear. So we want that equal to one. So it's a nonlinear uh, second order equation. And we will only look at the case. This equation is now elliptic. So more precisely, because here uh, we have a function f, a general function f. So more precisely, uh, we look at gamma. So we have a, in Rn, this is where the eigenvalues live. So uh, there is a gamma. We, this is the def, domain of definition of, of this uh, uh, f. So this gamma is a cone. So this gamma is an open convex symmetric cone. Symmetric meaning if lambda 1, lambda n in it, we make a permutation, it's still in it. So it's a vertex at origin. It contains the positive cone. It's like the first quadrant. All coordinates are positive. And gamma 1 is a half space. Gamma 1 is on this side. It's a half space. So, and f is a function, c1. And f lambda i, partial derivative in each lambda i is positive. This means the equation is elliptic. f is positive inside, f is equal to 0 on the boundary. So, these are... Uh, important examples is we take this case elementary symmetric function and gamma k is the component where sigma k is positive containing the positive cone. So then the, this is a these are important examples. So then so the fully nonlinear Yamabe problem is to assume the initially eigenvalues of this Schalten tensor is in this gamma. So find a u so that to make this equal to 1. So when you look at this equal to 1, one yeah, it, it's, yeah, OK. So you solve this. So, so the Yamabe problem is actually a, a special case if for f equal to sigma 1. So you, we take the sum of all eigenvalues. So, well, one, this, is, this looks rather general. So can one really solve something like that? So, well, the answer is yes, if this f, if the domain is locally conformally flat. So, then it's very general. So general f gamma like this. You can always solve it. So let's, let's look at the important case for uh, elementary symmetric functions. Then if this k is greater or equal to n over 2, then one can solve it. For k equal to 2, one can also solve it because this case, it's a variational problem. One has a variation one have a functional. One can look for gradient point of that functional. So there's a lot of work on it. So still, there are open <coughs> problems. So, so the, the main open problem here is look at a special case for sigma k and k between 3 and less than n over 2. So, so that's... Uh, so the answer uh, would be yes if one can prove a priori estimates. So namely, if one have a solution, then one show solution is upper bounded by a constant. So, so this is the main uh, remaining open problem now. So uh, in this, so well, why, why it, it is sufficient if one proves this a priori bound, then the problem is solved. Well, so 
this is a fully nonlinear uh, equation. Yeah. But for this equation, if we have upper bound with C, then, so through more than 10 years work of people, uh, one already know that there will be a lower bound also. And one also know that the gradient of U will be upper bounded. So this is C1 estimates. And then one also know C2 estimates. Once you have C0, C1, you will have C2. And once it's C2, then if this is a, a F is concave, like in this case, then one cl classical theorem like Krilov's uh, Evans will give C2 alpha, then shoulder estimates will give all derivative estimates. So namely, so using already known results, we'll have all derivative estimates. So if one have all derivative estimates, then one can <coughs> deal this problem by, uh, by, by, by a homotopy to a subcritical problem. And then one can solve it. So, so one can make a homotopy to a subcritical equation. So, so anyway, uh, uh, so the so this is the remaining is to prove C zero estimate. So, so what I will describe uh, here will be concerning the estimates uh, to go say from C0 to up. So already, if there's time, I will talk about uh, some cases C0 estimates. So, so in particular, we will not worry about remaining manifold for the time being. We, we want to establish estimates for Euclidean space and, uh, then, how, and then to, to go from Euclidean to remaining one have another step because that equation will have low order terms because of the remaining metric. So here I will only describe the uh, Euclidean case. And this Euclidean equation will also occur when one try to prove this C0 estimates. So, so usually when one treats C0 estimates, one can say suppose it's not true, then C0 estimates fail, then one rescale that sequence of solutions, one will end up with a solution equation in the whole space. And that, then this will be the equation if one rescale appropriately. So, so this will be an AU is a second order uh, operator like this. So this operator looks, uh, looks complex. Uh, but this operator is the only conformally invariant second order uh, operator. So it's a nitro object. And also many of the proofs can be made uh, using this conformal invariance proper property and uh, it doesn't, yeah, one can use it that way, so. Well, so this type of equations, there's a uh, classic work of uh, Louis and uh, Nuremberg and uh, uh, Sprague. So they s studied uh, second order fully nonlinear elliptic equations, their kind of problem. So this equ the equation we look at uh, is kind of resembles that, that equation. It has some low order terms and, and it has some additional feature is there's a conformal invariance of the equation. So in, in the uh, talks, uh, I, I will describe some estimates. Yeah. So for this Euclidean space, and I will mention some open problems. So the first, uh, Problem I will describe a Liouville uh, type theorem. So, 
So this theorem says that if we have a positive continuous function in Rn minus zero, so and set, satisfy in viscosity sense, the eigenvalues of this AU, we have n eigenvalues, they lie on the boundary here. So the equation is the eigenvalue lies there. So uh, we let's just look at U is C2, then it has clear meaning what that means. Otherwise, there's a weak meaning. So, and we can think of a C2. So, if the equation is satisfied in Rn minus zero, in the space minus a point, then the solution must be radially symmetric about the point. And the corollary is if the equation is satisfied in the whole space, then it's a constant. Okay. So, so I will uh, describe uh, this. So if if gamma is equal to gamma one, so where gamma one uh, is here is the half uh, uh, is half space. So then this statement is actually the classical Liouville theorem. The reason is this lambda AU belongs to here. It's the same as Laplace U equal to zero. So, so if we take all, it, we take the trace, these two terms will disappear. So it just means that. So then the classical Liouville theorem says that the, the corollary one it is the classical Liouville theorem. So it says that a positive harmonic function has to be a constant. <coughs> so uh, I will describe a proof of this. So let's say uh, U is C2. So, so I will only, I think I will describe a proof of U is C2, and I will indicate uh, some, uh, at some key point, some proof depends only on the C0 property of U, and that's a key reason why the whole thing can go to C0. So, and uh, let's, let's prove for theorem one. So, of course, uh, if one needs to prove, well, this, this Liouville theorem uh, is needed when studying the problem I described before. So when there's a need to establish something like that. And naturally, one can think uh, of uh, those ways to prove the uh, classical Liouville theorem. So which one can be made uh, going through to this nonlinear set? Anyway. <coughs> So, so actually, the, the, the way we describe here, uh, okay, yeah. So, so this, 
if we look at the harmonic function, we know when we make a Kelvin transformation, it's still a harmonic function. So here uh, we have this invariance also. So, so it's invariant under Kelvin transform, Kelvin transformation. So what is a Kelvin transformation? So if we take a ball of radius lambda, sorry that I use lambda to, for the radius to denote radius and here to denote eigenvalues. So I, I, I will just keep this, yeah. I, so I, there are two lambda here going on. And uh, here is a ball of radius lambda and centered at x. And if we have a function u, whenever we have a function u, we can cook up a function. It's called a Kelvin transformation. So it's lambda my minus x. So it's a Kelvin transformation. And uh, the u0,1 is the one uh, which may look more, certainly look more familiar. This is a Kelvin transformation. This is with respect unit ball centered at zero. Here we just change the ball naturally. So that's the Kelvin transformation. And with this expression, one can calculate that actually the eigenvalue uh, of this is actually the same as that. So the eigenvalue of this conformal Hessian AU, when we make a Kelvin transformation, it's actually the same. It's actually the same. Essentially, this is the only operator which can give you this property. Yeah. That's, that's the, a defining property for the operator. <clears throat> so because of that, then the equation, so this is an equation, so lambda, this is our equation. So this equation is invariant. So, so that when you have a solution of this equation, the equation we look at, then when we make a Kelvin transformation, it's always a solution. So our equation is invariant under Kelvin transformation. We know this property for harmonic functions. Harmonic functions has this property. So. So we are going to prove this theorem. We are going to prove theorem one by proving the following. So we'll prove For every x in Rn, but not equal to zero, so this is the origin. So we'll prove for every x which is not equal to zero, and let me draw bigger. And we draw a ball of radius lambda for lambda bigger than zero, less than x. So for every point not equal to zero. So then 
will prove that u x lambda y, the Kelvin transformation, is greater or equal than u of y. For every y belongs to this ball minus this point x and also p. I'm going to call this point p. So p is the Kelvin transformation maps p to, so y goes to x plus lambda square y minus x over y minus x square. So if I take p here, I'm going to be mapped to zero and vice versa. Okay? So this is the symmetry point of zero with respect to the boundary of this sphere. So I denote that as p. So, so after the Kelvin transformation, when y is inside, if y takes p, then this expression, ux lambda expression, you, you, you can see a singularity because you may have a singularity as zero. And also here, if I take y equal to the center, then if you look at the expression here, when y is at x, this will be infinity. So one ha may have another singularity. So there are two possible singularities here. So that's why we write this inequality for Bohr minus these two points. So we are going to prove this. So once proving this, we, we will see symmetry. Yeah. The reason is, so if one can establish this, then we are going to see symmetry because First, from here, you will see that if you have zero and, and you have any x, if you draw a ball like this, so you, we have ux and we take the radius as absolute value, then we are going to have this order. So then this is true for every x not equal to zero. This is just by limit. You can go to there. So So then we will see that we want to prove we want to prove symmetry. Yeah. So now uh, I take x1 axis here. I take x prime as a remaining. And if we take every y, for every y, which y1 is positive, if I take any point y on this half plane, then we see that for x large, for r large, if I take this point as x equal to r zero, zero, if I take r very large, this ball will contain y, will contain y. So for large y, so we know that y will belong to b r x for large R. So now we know this inequality. We know from there this has an order u of y for large r because this y is inside now. So then I send r to infinity. Send r to infinity. So this will converge to 
u of y hat. So y hat is the symmetry point here with respect to the plane. So this is minus 1, minus y1, y prime. So this is minus y1 and y prime. Ah, cannot read now. Right, sorry, yeah. So this one actually will goes to u of minus y1, y prime. And this is y1 and y prime. So we have an order then. So this point, the value of u, is greater or equal than that point. And we can prove the other way. We put the ball on this side. So we showed that they are equal. They are equal. So then, and this is true for any, this x, y axis can be chosen arbitrarily. So this function u will be symmetric with any, with respect to any plane going through the origin, and we have the symmetry. So, so the main thing is to prove this. So once we have a way to establish this, we we'll get the symmetry. So, so we will prove this result by proving the following theorem. So we know that, so here we know that this u, we know u in this setting will be equal to u on the boundary of this region, of this ball. Okay, we know that. Because this Kelvin transformation is a reflection with respect to that. We can look at the formula. So they are the same. They are the same. And we also know that lambda of a u satisfies the equation inside. And we know that the reflected one satisfies the equation may, may, may miss two points. And we want our conclusion is we have this order. So this is a maximum principle statement. So so we, we need a maximum principle statement like this. We have a bounded domain. This omega will be this ball. And we have, two, we have some singular points. So here there are two singular points, x and p. And one solution, which is, this is more general, which is on, on one half space. This should be minus gamma, so I, I shouldn't have a bar there, okay? I shouldn't have a bar there. No bar there. So Rn minus gamma, and the V is belongs to, this belongs to gamma bar. So then we have V greater or equal than U on the boundary, and we want to have this order inside. So this is a maximum principle state. And this so if this is harmonic function, and we have that, yeah, we have that. So, so, I, so, to, so we first describe a proof of this without singularity, namely this statement. So suppose these two functions, they, they set, again, there's no bar here. So two functions, they satisfy 
and, and for the time being, we, we just think of this uh, boundary gamma. We can think of that. So if we have an order uh, uh, on the boundary, then we have an order inside. On the ball, yeah. Yeah. Is it clear why, yeah. why, why uh, they are actually equal? Because uh, because of this, uh, if yeah. So I so this will be lambda. So this cancels. So y minus x. So this become y. Infinity. U, U x lambda at x, yeah. Uh, oh, wait, wait. Uh, yes, I, this will be bigger than that. Yes. Oh, we 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 are going to prove that. We we prove that. Yeah, yeah. That that. Has to be proved. Okay. Yeah. Uh, this, is, this is the yeah yes yes yeah, yeah. that that needs to be proved. Yes 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 that that needs to be proved, and uh, so uh, I would say that's that's the the main main harder part to prove. Yeah, that's the only part, in a way, the the, the tougher one. To, 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 to deal with, yeah. Uh, well, well, I may not, but anyway, uh, that, that's, that may not be, uh, that state may not be true, but both, both to, when, when proving this, uh, both require some thoughts, yeah. But, but that's not, not, not obvious, this order, not obvious, yeah. So, so, so uh, yes. So this is one one step. One step. One step is to see the idea is assuming everything is smooth. Yeah. Then then there's a separate step to address this uh, singularity. So, so if either lambda of AU belongs to Rn minus gamma bar, so the original, I should not have that. So, or lambda of AV belongs to gamma. So, so this, this means this is a strict subsolution. So for, for the gamma 1 case, this is just say Laplace and U is strictly positive. So this is a strict super solution. So in the Laplace case, this is Laplace and V should be less than zero. So if one of them satisfies the equation uh, uh, super, uh, 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 strict, so then uh, this statement is very simple. So this is simple. So the proof is straightforward. So let's describe the proof. This proof
So then, so then, would we prove by contradiction? So if not, one can maybe one can draw something like this. This is going to be a v, and uh, maybe u would be something like this. This would be u, and here I will. This is omega. So v on the boundary is greater or equal than u, but inside somewhere v u is bigger than v. So will be a picture like this. So then. I use blue. Blue can run red. Blue is okay, right? Ah. So, <coughs> so then we multiply this v by we multiply this v by a number. We can find a b bigger than one to put it in a, the following position. So. This is v hat. So, so namely, so this v hat is greater than or equal than u in omega, and v hat is bigger than u on boundary omega, and v hat actually equal to u at one interior point. So it's quite clear from the picture. So, and this equation, if we look at the expression of this uh, AU, so lambda of AV hat is simply equal to a positive multiple of lambda of AV because of the expression. Oh, this is not readable anymore. So, so therefore, this is still satisfying the same same equation. So, satisfying the same equation. So, this is belongs to gamma bar. It still satisfies the same equation because gamma is a cone. Our definition: gamma is a cone. So, then at the touching point. So this is the x bar. So at touching point, we see the gradient should be the same because there's a minimum point of the difference. So, and the Hessian should be greater or equal than that. So, of course, we already know that this is the same. Then, if we look at the expression of AU, we see immediately that AV hat at x bar should be less or equal than AU x bar. And certainly, eigenvalues will also have that order. So property one property of one property of this gamma is if lambda is in gamma, mu greater or equal than zero, namely which mu is every coordinate of mu is greater or equal than zero, then the sum will still be in gamma. This follows from the 
convexity of gamma and the fact this gamma contains the positive cone. So now, for instance, we said if either, for instance, if we assume this, the other one is the same. If we assume this, then this will imply lambda of AU would also belong to gamma and would violate the assumption violating lambda of AU should be in Rn minus gamma. As I said, this should be taken out that gamma bar, at the bar. So it's, it's a contradiction. Okay. So, so namely, if we have one of this condition is strict, then the proof just follows from this very quickly. So then the question is, uh, in, in this case, what, uh, how to prove, yeah. Well, actually this proof may remind us uh, of the a proof which one may, may be the fir first proof of many people have seen to prove the maximum principle for Laplacian. It's a <coughs> similar proof. So then what do we need to do? So we only need to prove the following. We only need to say there exists a sequence of solution of in C2, and Vi goes to V in C0, and lambda of Avi is in, in gamma. So we only need to ap approximate our V so that we have C0 convergence, but we are able to make this eigenvalue go to uh, gamma. Okay. For example, you know previously this, this eigenvalue of for V may very well be lying here. Okay. So, lambda, okay. so you want to perturb your V in C0 norm controlling these eigenvalues inside. So, so this depends on uh, the equation. Yeah. So if, if you can do that, then it works. Yeah. We, our proof just works. So the main thing is to make this work, the main thing is to achieve that. So you want to be able to perturb, uh, to make an approximation of V, but to move this, uh, eigenvalues inside, so from, from super solution to strict super solution. So to do that, it's easier to work with this expression. It's harder to, well, uh, uh, well for, for this, uh, it doesn't matter that much uh, if we don't keep track of the dependence that carefully. For this, we don't need to. So anyway, so let's make a change anyway. So then we write it as in that. So we just rewrite this in terms of W. So that's the expression. When we compute, it looks like that. So uh, uh, let's, so we are, in, instead of perturbing V, we are going to perturb W. W expression looks neater. So, so let's take, define a function. Let's take this function. So we take some small delta, and this is just an exponential function.
So then a calculation, a calculation will give the following. So for epsilon and delta small, we are going to prove this. We are able to prove this inequality. Here, we need the structure of this operator. So namely, this is uh, 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 equation dependent. We, we are working with this equation. It has this nice property. And moreover, the dependence of this, as in the proof, one can see that the dependence of this only depends on C0 information. So we'll see that, just look at the proof, we'll see that the smallness depends only on a, a lower bound, a positive lower bound of W. So that's the reason uh, all these theorems will work going to C0 sense. And to C, well, of course, if one can have this inequality, that means from a W, where AW is, say, in the closure, when we make a small perturbation in C0 norm, we are pushing that inside by a strict positive amount of lambda. We are pushing it that way. Yeah. So, that will, so then, uh, after that, we can just take, say, we can take epsilon i equal to delta i goes to zero, and we define our vi through this w. Then this vi will have the property, because Clearly, this will go to that C0, and this will. So how to make this uh, calculation so we can, so how to prove this step? <coughs> so, well, here, here it just says that if we can do this, so this approximation, this property will just follow immediately. So to prove this step, uh, one calculate uh, W plus epsilon. Because this AW is quadratic, so we have AW plus linear term in epsilon and plus quadratic in epsilon. So if we replace in this expression Hessian W by that, because this is the definition yeah, of AW. So then, if you insert that, the second derivative will be replaced by AW itself plus first derivative information. Yeah, if this is, then we have that. So this is harmless because this is a cone structure says if you change, this is still in gamma bar. And that term, uh, the gradient term actually is a good term. So this will help later also when, when so, so this is a good term, actually. And then the explicit expression, if we compute, we will see that it's bigger than that. Because this term raised to a square can be absorbed by that and left with a delta square term. So for delta small, one will have this. So, so the linear term is actually gaining that. So then we squeeze epsilon we will have that. So, so this will, this proves uh, this inequality. So, so we have proved the, this maximum principle statement for smooth in the domain. So maybe I, I'll stop here.